Welcome to the news on NT International. I am Olajide Bello. You can watch this news on our various social media platforms displayed on your screen. But let's start with the headlines. Federal government adopts new strategy for economic recovery. Five executive orders underway to check inflation. Duke and Duchess of Sussex get a warm reception as they take royal visit to Lagos. And Indonesia continues search of people trapped in rain as floods render residents homeless. In continuation of his ongoing visit to Nigeria to promote the Invictus Game and other humanitarian activities, the Duke of Success, Prince Harry and his wife Meghan are in Lagos where they are pledged commitment to growing basketball talent in Africa through the Giants of Africa project. Joel Popola reports that the couple promised to build more basketball courts across Nigeria through their foundation to witness talents in the country. Apart from sports, in the Invictus game, Prince Harry assured the people that there are other humanitarian initiatives that will soon begin to manifest for the benefit of Nigerians. Each and every one of you here today, sitting on this court, I know you're ready to go. And we're going to get those moves ready, and you're going to show us how good you are. And we're going to have those of us who share who you are. We are thrilled to be here. I would say on a personal note, I lived in Toronto for seven years, and lived in Paris for these games. And that was the first time I ever heard of Giants in Africa. So I'm going to talk about full circle. Never did I think that we would be able to be here all these years later, supporting the expansion of this incredible organization through our foundation, our Adult Foundation. So we are just so grateful. We're proud of all the work that you're doing for everyone who helped bring this event together today. Thank you. The media who's very covering to expand the knowledge for everyone to know how incredible the work is that they are doing here. Following her declaration two years ago of having a 43% Nigerian DNA Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, received a grand welcome in the fold. Deborah Balagwe will report that the event was at a reception in honor of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Need come boss there presenting the Duke and Duchess of Sussex with the traditional attire from the West, the popular Ashoiki. Abike Dabri Erewa, while commending the Duke for his laudable initiative of the Invictus Game, expressed the light that the Duchess accepted her motherland and hoped that she would also contribute her quota to the growth and development of the nation. The commission set up by the Nigerian government to harness the enormous potentials of Nigerians in the diaspora, which of course includes you, our beautiful princess. So we welcome you home today. It's your first visit, but hopefully not your last visit. And we hope you come back home again and again and again. By uniting our efforts, we can make remarkable progress in acknowledging the sacrifices made by our military personnel. Various speakers also commended the Duke and Duchess for the rehabilitation of wounded servicemen of the force who have served their nation. The pair are in Nigeria to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Game, founded by the Duke himself, with 23 nations involved in 2,500 communities. Five Invictus Games have been held so far. Deborah Balagubu, NT News. Spain's Catalan region has maintained its desire to the independent of Spain seven years ago through a referendum considered illegal and raised skirmish leading to arrest of separatist leaders. Voters have two choices of the possibility of the return of power of a separatist politician who led a breakaway attempt in 2017 or an anti-independence government led by the Socialist Party. Kolo Mohamed tells us more. Catalans vote to either continue with the separatist government or opt for a change under a pro-Spanish unity leadership established nearly seven years ago. 
this region was pushed into chaos as a referendum that was declared illegal was held in a bid to separate with Spain. It triggered of one of the most serious constitutional crises in Spain since the return to democracy. First, pushing the secession in the past struggle against Spanish Unionists while the preferred of the independence movement were arrested, tried and imprisoned for their roles in the referendum. The regional president went into self-imposed exile where he remains, risking arrest if he were to return to Spain. While the Spanish Prime Minister issued a pardon and released the other convicted separatist politicians in 2021, he however upheld a ban on their holding public office. Reports say a controversial amnesty deal he struck with the separatists had gone some way to curbing attention between Madrid and Barcelona, and the desire for independence had diminished while other issues are taking precedence. There are more important things to focus on, like employment and social welfare. They could have done that, but they haven't because of these elections. Some Catalans say the dream of an independent Catalonia is a far from prospect. And there are those who believe it is the only credible future for the region. Kolom Hamad, NTNS. As a result of the physical, moral, and spiritual dangers inherent in the peak and environs of its peak, Nepal Supreme Court has ordered the government to limit the number of mountaineering permits. Kolom Mohammed tells us more. The Himalayan Republic is home to eight of the world's ten highest peaks and welcomes hundreds of adventurers each spring when temperatures are warm and winds are calm. The Supreme Court has ordered a limit to the number of climbers and also given measures for waste management and preservation of the mountain's environment. The verdict states that the mountain's capacity must be respected and an appropriate maximum number of permits should be determined. Nepal currently grants permits to all who apply and are willing to pay $11,000 to scale the Everest, the world's highest peak at 8,849 meters above sea level. Last year, the country issued a record high 478 permits for the Everest. A massive human traffic jam on Everest in 2019 forced teams to wait hours at the summit in freezing temperatures, risking depleted oxygen levels that can lead to sickness and exhaustion. Nepal officials say the mountain is getting too much pressure and a respite must come through now. The court's decision also orders restriction on the use of helicopters for emergency rescues only. Kolom Hamad, NTNews. Flooding and landslide have continued to ravage different parts of the globe as major impacts of climate change. Kolom Mohammed brings us up to speed about the latest flooding in Indonesia. In Indonesia, Every minute counts in the search for survivors still trapped in the rains. The country's rivers have had their banks submerged as aquifers free birds have been crossed by volumes of water from heavy continuous rains. Rescuers are looking for survivors in different islands of the nation, combing through mountainous areas, floating in rescue boats in hopes to find victims in need for a ride out of danger. There is a village up there where at least three houses have been carried away by flood water. We count 18 survivors from the Wajo area. More people still being picked up there. In Sidrap, there are 17 survivors and more people are being rescued. And please note that in Luvu, 60 people survived. The severe flooding and mudslides have rendered hundreds homeless, while many are still missing at the time of filing this report. It is a rainy season, and mudslides are said to be common occurrences in this part of the world. One factor said to be responsible for wide and severe disasters currently is deforestation, especially from illegal mining in the land, which is said to make the soil more unsteady, leading to floods and landslides along roads and residential buildings, which has in turn made many people homeless and vulnerable to epidemics. Indonesia is a leader in mining nickel, a crucial metal in the transit to net zero economy. Experts say climate change makes extreme weather like this more frequent. Kolom Hamad, NTNews. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, the debate continues over the president's call for a review of the country's constitution. Many believe it is time for amendments that reflect a new era for the country, but opposition figures says it could lead to a more unrest in a country that seems constantly on the edge. 
President of the Democratic Republic of Congo has ignited debate by calling for the review of the country's constitution. He made the remarks during his recent trip to Belgium. The Congolese in the diaspora called for changes to constitutional articles that allow public officials to hold several positions and to those that hinder reforms in the best interests of the people. The president's supporters have hailed the proposal. There are so many mistakes in our constitution, but our president is a Democrat. President Chisekedi has a duty to respect the constitution. He already has a prime minister, but he has to wait for the two chambers of parliament to be in place in order to form a government, because that is what the constitution says. But opposition members have rejected the idea. We strongly confirm without fear of contradiction that the constitution of our country does not block any efforts of setting up government institutions. What is blocking the country today is the wrangling by politicians over who should occupy key positions. That, as well as the incompetence, materialism, fanaticism, corruption and tribalism which characterizes the rot in the president's ruling coalition. Legal experts say while the law allows the president and parliament to review the constitution, it clearly states when that can happen. It's not the right time for the people in power to revise the constitution because Article 219 prohibits any revision when a part of the country is under the state of siege or at war. Violent clashes have been going on between the DRC army and the M23 rebels in eastern DRC since 2021. The DRC president said changing the constitution is aimed at adapting it to the country's current challenges. The current constitution was adopted in 2006 during the Third Republic. Many of the people opposed to the review of the Congolese constitution fear that President Chisekedi, who is serving his second and last term, may change the article on the president's tenure and seek to run again in 2028. The country's leading opposition figures have warned of an outbreak of violence if that happens. President Bola Tinubu extends his warm congratulations to the President of the Republic of Chad, Mohamed Derby, on his re-election victory. President Tinubu affirms that the successful conduct of elections in the nation underlines the commitment of the government and the people of Chad to democracy and orderly transition in the region. The president assures President-elect Derby that Nigeria will continue to work closely with the Republic of Chad as both countries seek to enhance peace, security and shared prosperity for the mutual benefits of their people. The president also calls for sustained friendly cooperation between both nations while wishing the president-elect success as he undertakes this noble service to the people of Chad. President Bola Tinubu has congratulated a retired Justice of the Supreme Court, Mary Odili CFR, on the occasion of her birthday. Justice Odili, an eminent jurist, was the Deputy Chairman of the National Judicial Council in JC, serving as Deputy to the Chairman, Chief Justice of the Federation at the nation's Apex Judicial Commission. President Tinubu celebrates the legal salon not only for her outstanding achievements in her calling, but especially for her work in uplifting the downtrodden and providing succor to the needy. The president wishes the esteemed jurist and the orderlies many more years of service to the nation in good health. Five executive orders underway to ensure a downtrend of inflation and promote economic growth among other issues in a matter of days. This is as the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms meets to consolidate on progress of work and critical reforms. Benny Adams reports. She has a spoon. One day she showed me 11 agencies that are passing the money of the book. Representing the Vice President of Nigeria, Dr. Aliu Modibo's family is among millions of Nigerians who are victims of more than 60 official and 200 unofficial taxes, levies and dues in Nigeria today. A situation the organized private sector say does not support business growth. Your administration has a unique opportunity to make a difference so that businesses as corporate citizens we have their rights protected and their businesses guaranteed. Now, beyond proposals, mechanisms for sustainable implementation has been worked upon. Up until the end of June, we envisage by the quarter three, our documents will be ready to go to the National Assembly 
and by the end of that Q3, uh, we should have them enacted into law. Uh, but where we have executive orders, directive regulations uh, that don't require enactment into law, like we have a new withholding tax regulation where small businesses would be exempted from having to deduct withholding tax. That based on the existing law today, you don't need to enact it into law. We just need the minister to sign. So it's ready. Uh, we're waiting for the final uh, signature. We also have a new national tax policy that communicates this direction of our tax system, how we're going to be uh, spending our money. We have a spending policy now, as well as borrowing policy, so that the social contract to the people is delivered to them in a meaningful way. So far, the grand plan to reduce in Nigeria's existing payable taxes from 62 to a maximum of 9 and raking in more revenues for government is being achieved. The esteemed members of the committee, numbering more than 70, say now is that time for the critical reforms budding on legislation to ensure in sustainable implementation of the proposed amendments. In Abuja, Benny Adams, NTA News. You're watching the news on NTA International. More reports after this break. We will walk diligently to make sure every Nigerian feels the impact of their government, the economic aspirations, and the material well-being of, uh, of the poor, the most vulnerable, and the working people shall not be neglected. It is in this spirit that we are going to implement a new national living wage for our industrious workers this new year. It is not only good economics to do this, it's also a morally and politically correct thing to do. Thanks for being there. The Minister of Aviation and Aerospace Development, Festus Kiyamu, reaffirmed his determination to remain focused towards improving the welfare of workers to enhance performance for higher productivity. The Minister stated this in a message during the post May Day Conference in Abuja. The conference with the theme, Impact of Government Policies on Nigerian Workers, Oil Subsidy Removal on Perspective, is geared towards enhancing strategic goal of the new hub agenda of improving the welfare of Nigerian workers and Nigerians in general. One is capability management and talent management. Capability building and talent management. That's the first pillar. The second pillar is performance management system. The other one is innovation. Part of innovation is also thinking out of the box. Victoria! Other speakers from the Joint Consultative and Negotiating Council, as well as the associations of the Aviation Trade Union, maintain their solidarity towards working together of building a more committed workforce for the overall development of the country. In Abuja, Ali Kabir, NTA News. The National Working Committee, NWC, of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, at its 586th meeting in Abuja, has called for unity and reconciliation among its various stakeholders. This is coming ahead of the forthcoming governorship election in Edo State. Timothy Yusuf reports. Following what the People's Democratic Party described as successful National Executive Committee meeting recently, two major tags now ahead, governorship elections in Edo and Undo states. Debo Oluguagba, the National Publicity Secretary of the PDP, said the NWC and joined all leaders, stakeholders and teaming members of the party in Edo State to, in the overall interest of the people and the party, close ranks and work together for the success of the forthcoming governorship election in the state. The NWC, he noted, considered the reaction and or statement credited to the National Vice Chairman South South, Chief Danobi, on the membership of the Edo State Governorship Election Campaign Council. 
and that after a thorough review of the issues and in the spirit of unity and reconciliation, the National Vice Chairman South South, despite his initial displeasure over the constitution of the Edo State Campaign Council, reconsidered and accepted his inclusion and membership of the Campaign Council. NWC urged the people of Edo State to continue in their support and solidarity for the party and governorship candidate Asue Igodalo. All party members to continue to work together for the success of the party, for the benefit of Nigerians and the sustenance of democracy in our country. The National Working Committee NWC also during the meeting revisited the issue of the Ebony State Caretaker Committee and reconsidered the imperatives of bringing all stakeholders of the party in the state together. Timothy Yusuf, NTN News. The Joint Task Force South-South Operation Delta Safe has renewed its call on members of the public for continued support in the fight against illegal bankering. Commander Operation Delta Save made the call after a successful clampdown operation at a forest in Okwa West, local government area of Abia State. Aya Prezi reports. Victory in the fight against illegal bunkering activities in Nigeria may seem slow, but it is certainly sure as the Joint Tax for South South Operation Delta Save is determined and insistent on reducing the illegal business to the barest. It is in such a high spirit of determination Rear Admiral John Okeke, who resumed as the new commander of the Joint Tax Force on February 15, 2024, as Ray could his zero tolerance stand on illegal bunkering while speaking to journalists after a successful busting operation at illegal refinery site inside a forest in Ukwa West local government area of Abia State. Within here, we have over 17 divisions according to their naming. Each of these divisions houses over 40 cooking sites. Today, we've been able to traverse 40 of such uh, sites. Of course, behind me, you could see the one that is ongoing, the construction is ongoing, far larger than two trucks. You can imagine the quantity of the products they would have stolen and they, you know, refined here. If we're able to check where these seeds are being cooked, they will not have any place to source the illegal refined product. So we don't have suspects as we speak. But you can see we've been able to deny them these facilities. So, and that is my focus, to tackle the menace from where the production is being done. The Operation Delta Save Commander, who attributes the success of the clampdown operations to an intelligence provided by public-spirited individuals, looks forward to sustain cordial civil-military relations in the fight against illegal bunkering activities. You can see to yourself, we're under thick forests. Even if you are flying your drones, as you rightly said, or a helicopter, you will not be able to observe anything. But thank God for leveraging intelligence. And that is why I've always called that the civil populace, very, very key, very critical to our operation. Items recovered from the legal refinery sites include iron pipes and rods, hoses and dismantled pieces of iron panels, among other items. In Ukwa West local government area of Abia State, Aya, Prezi, NT News. A 75-year-old man alongside an old woman of the same age have been arrested for allegedly dealing in illicit drugs. As operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency and DLA intercept three trailer loads of opioids comprising thousands of pills and bottles of codeine syrup at Amu Wardoff in local government area of Lagos State. Salwa Khal Ibrahim reports. The multi billion naira consignments were loaded in three trailer trucks comprising 3,450,000 pills and 344,000 bottles of codeine syrup at a warehouse in Abu Leado, where NDLEA officers eventually arrested the suspect in connection with the seizure on Thursday, 9th May 2024. Similarly, another 160 liters of codeine syrup were recovered from two different suspects on the same day in Lagos State. NDLEA operatives 
on Saturday 11th May raided the Igwe Forest in Ovia Northeast local government area of Edo State where more than 11,000 kilograms of cannabis was destroyed on three farms measuring 4.65 hectares while additional 188 kilograms of the same psychoactive substance was recovered and a suspect arrested during the overnight operation. A 75-year-old grandpa was on Friday 10th May arrested with 7.5 kilograms of cannabis in a kitty state during a raid operation while a 70-year-old grandma was snapped with 15.6 kilogram of same substance on Thursday 9th May during a raid in Makodi, Benue State. In Abuja, Salwa Kalil Ibrahim. NTA News. The National Population Commission, NCPC, is uh, strategizing on how to meet demographic demands that will facilitate progress of all major themes of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, for Nigeria and re-examine the status of the country's long-awaited population and housing census at a management retreat in Rio Akwaibom State. INEC NPC, beg your pardon, Chairman Nasser Sakwara says, the retreat is an extensive discourse on the structure and operations of the Commission for Improved Service Delivery. Ulusheye Adiabu reports. Nigeria has over time been faced with substantial demographic challenges. And here, the management of the National Population Commission, NPC, from the 36 states of the Federation and LCT, joined by the members of the Senate Committee, on national identity and population wants to critically stray standard operational procedures in generating demographic data for national planning purposes. And comprehensive population data in the fabric of effective governance cannot be overemphasized. And our presence here today signifies a collective dedication to these values. The Commission is contending with a rising national and international expectation for accurate and relevant data for the purpose of planning and policy making against the backdrop of our dwindling resources. This retreat, therefore, offers practical solution on repositioning the Commission for optimal performance. The retreat is unique and timely. I am optimistic that it will contribute to the efficient management of men and resources in the Commission. Immediately after the training, I have to go back to the state to make sure that I also cross-check based on the presentation that I've done here, all those things are in place in my state. Continued advocacy to mobilize resources required to execute a new national aid camp for Nigeria first time in 18 years tops resolutions as the day one of the retreat. Olusheye Adiagbo, NTA News. Well, this is where we end the news on NTA International. Thanks for watching. I am Olajide Bello.